So to make sure everybody's in the right spot, we're going to be talking about some of the accounting changes. I think uh, Ed did a great job of discussing the uh, PPP regulations and uh, uh, the uh, continuing uh, positive news that's coming out in terms of the um, the new regulations. And uh, so I want to get started with uh, maybe talking a little bit about since we have these PPP loans. Um, you know, what's going to happen from a forgiveness perspective. Oops, sorry. So uh, accounting regulations have recently come out. And basically, there are two ways that the PPP loan forgiveness can work. Um, nonprofits can choose either one of the two ways. Uh, For-profit entities must choose the first one. So the first way is to treat uh, the uh, PPP as a loan. Uh, and then when the loan is actually forgiven, then you would record uh, forgiveness, which would be an extinguishment of debt. So at the time that the loan comes in and the cash hits your account, you would record debt on your books. So it would be, you know, um, and we'll get into the actual journal entries in a minute, but you'll record debt on your books. You'll accrue interest over the term of the loan. And then when the loan is uh, forgiven, you'll have a gain on extinguishment of debt. Okay. And that's when it's legally released. So um, while it's not clear, we're assuming that means when the SBA, because what's going to happen is you're going to apply with the, the bank for forgiveness. Uh, the bank is going to review the application um, and then it goes to the SBA. So when the SBA gives its approval, I think that's when it's legally released and you no longer owe, owe the money. And that's when it will be treated as a forgivable loan uh, and forgiveness will be recorded as revenue at that time. So for most organizations, um, if you're a calendar year organization, that might happen by the end of this year. More likely uh, for many organizations, that's going to happen in calendar 2021. For fiscal organizations, again, that could happen in fiscal 2021. So we don't think that, you know, so if organizations are looking to push that revenue off, they would choose the first option. Second option is to treat the uh, monies coming in as a conditional contribution. So basically looking at it as a refundable advance. So you, again, once again, record it as a liability on your books. It's a refundable advance. Um, you would still have to accrue interest on it. But then what would happen is as you incur expenses attributable to that loan, um, and those are forgivable expenses, you would then recognize the revenue as forgivable expenses are incurred. Now, again, um, you kind of have to, to look at the position you're in and, and you have to make sure that from a forgivable um, expense perspective, you understand what forgivable expenses are, and you have to determine that those forgivable expenses are, um, or those expenses are actually going to be forgiven. I know there's still a lot of questions sitting out there with respect to um, organizations that are government funded. So if you're getting money from a governmental agency, um, and you're also getting the, PP have the PPP loan and you're using it to pay for payroll, the question then comes into play, um, you've got this government funding, you've got the PPP loan, both of them may be covering the same costs. Um, are those um, costs really, for, well, they will be forgivable under PPP, but is that going to run into a problem with your funding source? Uh, and I know a lot of the funding sources are looking at this right now. Uh, I know all of the agencies that settle under the CFR, Consolidated Fiscal Report, are all looking at this and trying to come up with how it's going to be treated for that purpose. Um, you've got Department of Health is looking at it from a Medicaid perspective. So there's a lot of questions still out there in terms of how that's going to be um, ultimately reconciled. Um, but understand that if there's uh, conditions or if you're not exactly sure if that money is going to be forgivable or, or if you're going to be asking for forgiveness for it, because while it may be forgivable, it may have a negative impact on your rates or, or uh, reimbursement. So if you're not really sure, uh, you wouldn't recognize the uh, income until uh, you're sure and that there's no conditions left. So kind of keep that in mind when you're going through it. <clears throat> so let's go through an example here. I think it's a lot easier. I'm, I'm a very visual person, so I think it's a lot easier if we go through an example. It might be uh, kind of easier to see here. So let's assume that we have a nonprofit that got a half a million dollar PPP loan on May 1st of 2020. Uh, the uh, nonprofit is incurring allowable costs of $50,000 per week. 
Uh, they don't anticipate any penalties. And remember, as Ed kind of laid out, there are several penalties that come into play. Um, if you cut your staff salaries by more than 25%, that could result in a penalty. If you have a decrease in your FTEs and you don't meet any of the safe harbors, that could also have a decrease in the amount of the forgiveness and, and result in a penalty. So we're assuming in our example, we're gonna take a very, very simple example, half a million dollars, $50,000 a week of um, allowable costs incurred, no penalties, and then we're going with the interest of 1% for two years. Uh, as Ed mentioned, that that um, the loans have been extended to five years on a go-forward basis, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later, but we're just going to assume a 1% for two years, and then nonprofit anticipates the full amount of the PPP loan will be forgiven. So again, if they're spending about $50,000 per week, you got a half a million dollar loan, um, the loan, theoretically, we would have expended all of the funds within a 10-week period of time. Let's look at the accounting treatment under the uh, two ways of, of doing this. So the first one is, again, accounting for the PPP loan is forgiveness. At the time the money came in, you would have debited cash, and this is on May 1st, of a half a million dollars, and you would have set up a loan payable of a half a million dollars. Um, assuming for argument that this organization has a June 30th year end, um, the interest on the debt would be uh, $833 from May 1st to June 30th, and that was calculated taking the $500,000 times 1% uh, divided by 12 times two months, May and June. That's $833. And then um, let's assume that you know um, eight months later, again, we're talking about a 10-month period of time here, eight months later, the uh, loan is forgiven. Theoretically, you would have calculated the interest through the end. I didn't do that here, but you would have calculated the interest through the end, so the interest would be a little bit higher than what's here. But you would debit the loan payable, you would debit the interest payable, and you would credit gain on extinguishment of debt. Um, that gain on extinguishment of debt, um, I would expect that it would go below the line as a non-operating uh, revenue, um, and it would probably need to be disclosed within your um, footnotes to the financial statements as an uh, unusual item. Um, so, uh, and it would show up on the statement of cash flows. Again, think about your statement of cash flows a second. This is a non cash item. You got the cash at the beginning. So, that would, uh, when you have that extinguishment of debt, uh, it would show up similar to where you're recording depreciation and stuff like that on your statement of cash flows. All right. So, seems pretty straightforward and, and uh, easy to follow. So let's look at the second example where it's a conditional contribution. So once again, the cash comes in on May 1st, you record, you debit the cash, you credit the refundable advance payable. So that's going to be, again, set up as a liability. As of June 30th, we would have had two months of operations of uh, allowable expenses. That's payroll, rent, utilities, all of those things. Um, so we'd have two months, so that'd be $100,000 of expense we would have laid out, and the credit would either go to accounts payable or cash either way. So that's $100,000. At the time that we incurred that $100,000 of expense, we would then recognize revenue. So we would, re we would reduce our refundable advance payable, right? So that goes down. It goes from 500 to 400. And we would pick up contribution or grant revenue of $100,000. So again, um, what you're doing here is you're matching the expense to the revenue. So you're recording the revenue as you incur forgivable expenses. And again, those can't be conditional. They must be forgivable expenses. Um, so again, over the 10 month period of time, um, the interest expense would have been $2,291 and 67 cents. And again, for, uh, generally accepted accounting principles, um, you would record an in-kind contribution for that interest expense that does not get picked up on your tax return because in-kind contributions, um, are not picked up. Uh, in, well, in-kind services, which uh, interest is considered a service, are not picked up on your tax return, but it would be, be picked up on your financial statements. Um, we're still unsure how this forgiveness, as I said earlier, is going to be treated by governmental agencies and, and how it's going to be treated on cost reports. So again, I think until we get more clarification, I think a lot of organizations are going to have to look at some of this forgiveness as um, conditional until we actually have real answers and whether they know they're going to be uh, applying for forgiveness on these loans, okay? So let's talk about some additional financial statement disclosures that are gonna come into play. Um, GAAP or generally accepted accounting principles has made it perfectly clear 
that while this pandemic is taking place and while the pandemic is having an impact on the financial statements of nonprofit organizations, pretty much every single financial statement is gonna need some level of disclosure, uh, even if there's really not deemed to have a significant impact, um, you're still gonna have to disclose something. So what we kind of put here is a general disclosure that we're gonna be putting in all of the financial statements of all of our clients, even if uh, COVID-19 is not uh, deemed to have a significant impact. Um, because again, nobody knows at this point in time, there's a lot of uncertainty. So basically it's just going to read as a result of the spread of the COVID-19 coronavirus, academic, uh, economic uncertainties have arisen, which may negatively impact operating results. The financial impact of the matter cannot be estimated at this time. So it'll just be a general note that's sitting there. Um, for those organizations um, that uh, the COVID-19 is going to have a significant impact, that footnote is going to be a lot more um, meaty. Than, than what's listed here. And when we talk about significant impact, I mean, if an organization is having a significant decline in its operations, I know a lot of um, early intervention organizations and, and organizations that um, are, have now moved to um, teletherapy type services and stuff have seen a significant decline in the amount of their uh, revenue coming into the organization. Um, so if you're seeing the decline in your operations, you're going to have to uh, reflect that or disclose that within the financial statements. Um, similarly, if you have a decline in investment portfolios, I know the stock market has been a little um, all over the place. It's it's picked up since the, the uh, initial decline in the, the coronavirus, but something that still needs to be uh, monitored. And if you're seeing significant declines in the investment portfolios, um, again, something that you're going to have to disclose within your financial statements. Uh, bank financing is a big issue. You have a lot of covenants that come into play. Uh, and to the extent that the um, the PPP loans or the uh, drop in operations and stuff are going to affect your bank financing and could have a, a negative impact, again, something that needs to be disclosed. And if your operations have, have deteriorated so uh, significantly that there might be an issue with a going concern, again, that's something that's going to have to be uh, considered as part of your um, process. Another thing that you're going to find for those organizations that are undergoing financial statement audits, uh, it's probably likely that your financial statement auditors are going to require some level of representation within the um, representation letter with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> A couple other things that have come up through the CARES Act, um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act um, added certain provisions. Um, Ed Probst um, from Vanguard will be discussing this uh, a little later. Um, so I'm going to leave that for him to discuss. Uh, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is we just have to remember that there were some additional provisions built into there that require additional sick leave for staff. Um, so anytime you have potential obligations, you need to remember that those obligations could create either a... Um, a transaction that needs to be recorded within your accounting records or at least a footnote. So again, you know, if your policy that you're establishing is going to allow um, your staff to carry the sick leave over or that you're going to be paying it out upon termination, then you have to accrue it um, and there might be some potential disclosure. So again, I just want people to, to realize that there's a lot of provisions within the CARE Act. There's a lot of new regulations. And when you're dealing with those provisions and regulations, they could have financial statement ramifications when we're looking at it. A um, couple other things. Um, I know somebody had asked uh, the question during Ed's session, but the PPP loans are not subject to uniform guidance. So um, you don't have to worry about the forgiveness of the loan being subject to uniform guidance, um, which uh, requires that any organizations that receive over $750,000 of federal funding um, would be required to go through a special uniform guidance audit. However, the EIDL loans, which Ed was talking about, are subject to uniform guidance. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, a, a new provision that just came out recently. Uh, there are these uh, HHS funds for any organizations that provide Medicaid funding. Those HHS funds will be subject to uniform guidance. So kind of keep that in mind too. Um, as Ed mentioned, organizations have the ability to defer the employer portion of the Social Security and Medicare tax. 
incurred to December for, uh, through December 31st, 2020. We're not talking about the trust portion. We're not talking about the amount that's being withheld from employee salaries. We're just talking about the employer portion here. 50% um, of that would be payable by December 31st, 2021 and 50% by 2022. As I said before, we have to make sure that that's properly uh, accrued within our financial records and that it's properly disclosed in terms of the policy or the um, track that the nonprofit organization has taken. Another thing that kind of comes into play here is that self-insured uh, organizations that are self-insured for unemployment. Um, you know, again, I know there's a lot of organizations that are self-insured, and I know for many organizations, the turnover has been relatively small. So that concept of being self-insured hasn't really been a big deal. But now with the coronavirus, where um, uh, employers or nonprofit organizations have been re uh, forced to either lay off or um, partially reduce the, or you know, reduce some of the hours that that people are working, or to furlough people, um, you're seeing a lot more people collecting unemployment now than uh, have in the past. So now you're in a situation where you really have to look at what the expectation is that you're going to be paying out in form of unemployment, and under the old FAS5 where, you know, if it's probable and estimatable, you have to accrue it. Um, remember the, the way the rules work. If you can, if it's probable that you're going to have to pay out the unemployment, which in most cases it, it is probable that you're going to have to pay it out because people are collecting it. And if you can estimate how much it's going to be, and that might be a little more difficult because you don't know how long people are going to be staying on unemployment. Um, but if it's probable and estimatable, you would record it as a liability on your books. Um, if it's one or the other, so if it's probable but not estimatable, you still have to disclose it. So there's going to be, at minimum here, a disclosure within your financial um, statements, a little more meaty than what you've traditionally done, where you don't just say you're self-insured, but you may have to disclose the fact that, you know, you have 27 employees that are collecting unemployment at a, you know, a monthly rate of X or whatever. Um, also, don't forget that the federal government has agreed to reimburse um, self-insured nonprofit organizations to the extent of 50% of the uh, amount that they're laying out. So um, they said that that will eventually come, but you have to lay out the money first. So you also may have a potential receivable or an amount that you can offset against that obligation that we talked about in the, the previous bullet, um, where you've got this receivable coming in for monies that you've already laid out, where you're waiting for the state to reimburse half of the monies that were paid. So again, you should go back calculate how much you've paid out in uh, unemployment attributable to the uh, coronavirus pandemic, and then determine that about 50% of that is going to be reimbursable to you. Um, if, if you are in a situation, uh, Shalom has just asked a question, what happens if um, you're disputing the unemployment claim and haven't heard back from DOL? Again, if you do not believe that the claim is a real claim, um, then I wouldn't accrue it. Um, again, I would track it and, and understand, but if you do not believe that there's a real claim sitting out there, um, you wouldn't accrue the claim. You'd only accrue the claim um, if you're in a situation where, again, it's probable that you're going to have to pay out uh, and um, you can estimate the amount. But if you don't believe that it's probable, you don't believe that you owe it, I wouldn't accrue it. <clears throat> um, we talked a little bit before about um, debt covenants. Um, remember that you've got the PPP loans that are coming in. Those PPP loans could impact some of the calculations on your debt covenants. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Make sure that you have good open communication with your banks. Um, I would reach out to my bank now uh, if you feel like there's going to be a problem with respect to uh, meeting any of the, the covenants so that you can start talking about waivers and, and making sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of how your operations are working. The other thing to keep in mind is that most lines of credit have a um, provision. It's called the material adverse change provision. And basically what that provision says is if there is a significant decline in the operations of your organization, the bank has the right to pull your loan. Um, and for many organizations that are functioning in this pandemic, they've seen significant drops in their revenue. Again, something else that you need to make sure that you're in conversation with your banks about to make sure that uh, everybody's on the same page in terms of um, 
you know, what your uh, operations look like today, what you expect your operations to look like going forward. Um, because again, um, if you're relying upon that bank debt uh, and that line of credit, you want to make sure that you've got good open lines of communication with your bankers. Uh, I know also Ed had talked about uh, the fact that it might be difficult for you to move from a two-year loan to a five-year loan. Again, there hasn't been a lot of that movement taking place. But again, if you're looking at your covenants and if the PPP loan, um, you don't expect that loan to be forgiven, uh, I would go back and start talking to the banks and see if there's a way you can move that loan from a two-year to five-year, especially if moving it from a two-year to a five-year loan is going to have a positive impact in terms of the uh, covenant calculations. <clears throat> I had said earlier, we would talk a little bit about the HHS Medicaid funding. Again, this is something that came out a couple weeks ago. Um, back in March or April, um, the HHS released some Medicare funding, and they had said that the Medicaid funding would be coming somewhere down the line. So this is that Medicaid funding that they were talking about. Um, it's going to be 2% of your 19 or 18 income. Um, so it could be a sizable number for an organization. Um, it's not available to any organizations that already receive funding from the general pool. So if you got some of that Medicare funding uh, way back in March and April, uh, you could be precluded from uh, getting these Medicaid funds. Um, the purpose of these funds is to cover additional uh, costs attributable to the COVID, like PPE type costs, restructuring your building, things like that. And it also is there to cover losses that you may have incurred during your operations. Um, keep in mind that um, this is an application process. You do have to apply for it. Uh, the application um, closes on July uh, 20th. So just keep in mind that if you are, uh, if you do receive any Medicaid funding, you have till July 20th, um, to apply for this. Uh, another thing that just came out yesterday, for anybody who is a uh, 1231 year-end filer um, and you have, uh, and you're subject to EO 38, Executive Order, the Executive Order 38, because you receive um, state funding or monies that pass through the state, um, the uh, EO 38 filing has been extended through September 29th, 2020. So you'll have till September 29th to uh, apply for that. Uh, a couple other things that uh, I want to kind of jump into. Um, there are a couple of accounting pronouncements that were supposed to be um, out this year and next, and those accounting pronouncements have been uh, pushed off. So uh, the first one that I want to talk about is the whole uh, revenue recognition um, pronouncement that was supposed to go into effect for this year. It's uh, for the year that just passed, I should say, that's been deferred until calendar 2020, or if you're a fiscal filer, um, fiscal 2021. So you have another year to adopt the revenue recognition um, pronouncement. Um, a lot of our clients are uh, continuing to adopt this year, and they are uh, looking to early adopt the, uh, um, the pronouncement. For most nonprofit organizations, this isn't going to have a a uh, significant impact on uh, how they recognize revenue. Remember that this is only for organizations that have exchange transactions, not contributions. So an exchange transaction is a transaction where both parties receive some level of value. So that'd be like FIFA service type uh, transactions. Um, anybody who's just strictly getting contributions uh, and not getting any revenue from any other sources, this revenue recognition policy doesn't even, uh, or pronouncement doesn't even impact them. But again, um, it's not really deemed to have, we haven't really seen it having a significant impact on many of our clients because many of our clients, if you are doing FIFA service, um, you know, you're recognizing revenue as you deliver the service. It could have an impact if you have high memberships. It could have an impact if uh, for like a, a college or university that might have a recognize, might be recognizing revenue over a period of time. Um, it could have an impact with royalty agreements and sponsorships and things like that. Um, where the sponsorship isn't a contribution, but it, there's other components to that sponsorship. Um, but I think for the most part, uh, most organizations aren't really seeing a um, kind of an impact there. <clears throat> the other uh, pronouncement that has been pushed off, and this is being pushed off to calendar 2021 or fiscal 2022, is this whole concept of accounting for leases. 
Um, I'm just hoping that they just push it off for another 20 years so I retire before this actually goes into effect. Um, but anyway, um, really what they're looking to do here is they're, they're trying to create consistency when you're looking at finance statements of organizations because some organizations own their buildings and other organizations rent. So they're trying to kind of get that off balance sheet risk and that off balance sheet liability onto the balance sheet. So they're, they're basically saying that any lease should be treated, uh, any long-term lease, I should say, should be treated uh, similar to our cap capital lease, where you would record the uh, asset on the books at the time that the, the lease is taking place, and that you would record the corresponding liability. Um, so really, it's taking that footnote disclosure that you have now of uh, where you um, you disclose the ongoing commitment where non-cancelable commitment with respect to the lease, and it's pulling that non-cancelable commitment onto the books. So again, you'd be recording the, on the uh, liability, the present value of the unpaid lease payments. So whatever the present value of that unpaid lease payments, and you'd be using prevailing interest rates at the time that the, the lease is entered into and everything else, but um, you know, all of that would come into play. So again, it's stuff that we've talked about in the past. It's stuff that we've covered uh, in prior years. Um, just kind of letting everybody know that this is, has been deferred. A couple other pronouncements um, that are out there. I mean, there are other things that are in, impacting the nonprofit sector, but they have very uh, limited application. These are probably some of the bigger ones. So for any nonprofit organizations that have intangibles, um, customer list goodwills, anything that was acquired, uh, uh, in the past, um, you would have to review that and you would make a discussion or decision whether that has been impaired. And it was either an all or nothing um, decision. So it was either impaired and I write off the impaired portion of it or I keep it on the books. Um, Gap had allowed for-profit, small non-publicly traded for-profits, they allowed them to depreciate or amortize, I should say, the intangible over a period of 10 years. That is now available to nonprofit organizations also. So if any nonprofit organizations have any intangibles on their books, they can um, amortize that over a 10 year period of time. They still have to do that impairment review on an annual basis, but again, it can be amortized over 10 years. For any organizations that have collections, so this will be for um, museums, it could be for religious organizations that have collections and things like that. Um, there have been some uh, new accounting pronouncements that come out and there. this is effective for for years beginning after 12, 15, 19. So it's gonna be for any calendar year 2020 or fiscal year 2021. Um, so what this does is it modifies the definition of collections and it adds new disclosures with respect to if you sell any of your collections, what happens to the proceeds. In the past, the accounting pronouncements basically said that if you sold your collections, the proceeds from that sale of collections had to be used to purchase additional collections. Um, the new um, pronouncement modifies that and it allows you actually to utilize the proceeds from the sale of collections uh, to maintain other existing collections that you have. So you don't have to buy new collections. You can use those dollars to maintain the existing collections you have. You just need to disclose what your policy is with respect to um, how you're going to use the funds uh, if and when you uh, sell off any component of your collections. So that's something new that it has to be disclosed within your finance statements for anybody who has collections. Finally, um, there's a new guidance with respect to, uh, or clarification with respect to contributions received and made. Um, this isn't new. This is uh, something we talked about last year during our uh, accounting update. It just provides clarification as to whether certain tr transactions um, are a contribution or exchange transaction, which is important because, again, remember, the exchange transaction is subject to the revenue rec and contributions are not. Um, I'm running out of time. So again, uh, thank you for uh, being part of this. Thank you for attending this event. And uh, I look forward to seeing you later this afternoon. Thanks everyone.